This video will be about TDIs from the Mark III to the Mark VII. If you want to learn specifically about the Mark VI cars, check out my Mark VI TDI Buyer's Guide as well. There will be some overlap if you watch both, but both videos will have extra information you might not get from the other. For some context, I've owned my TDI since 130,000 miles. It's currently at 192,000. I've done a lot of reading before and after buying. This is a passion of mine, and I'm always eager to learn something new about these engines. I've also helped maintain and repair various other TDIs owned by friends and family. To start off, let's talk about one of the biggest reasons people buy TDIs, real-world fuel economy. By and large, a TDI will get better fuel economy than the EPA estimates. The EPA tests aren't ideal conditions for TDI fuel economy. The way they test these cars is standardized instead of individualized per car. This is part of the reason why some cars get much less and others much more than the EPA estimates. The dieselgate cars especially get more as they were tested with the clean sheet, which resulted in less power and worse MPG. All TDI cars seem to follow this sort of trend though, willing you're able to adapt your driving habits. In my Mark VI TDI Golf with a manual transmission, the best tank I've gotten is 56 MPG, the worst I've gotten is 42. The 42 MPG tank was a lot of spirited driving and idling. Even when I pushed this car through some back roads with my buddies for an afternoon, I returned 40 MPG on the trip and 45 from the tank when I filled up later in the week. And the second item TDI buyers care about most, reliability. This car has never skipped a beat. I have had one issue, a busted sway bar end link that caused a clunk. 20 minutes and $50 to replace both sides, back in business, no more clunk. I've only done preventative maintenance, one set of brakes, and the sway bar end links. It's never let me down, never been stuck on the side of the road. There was one issue before I hit the infamous pothole though. I did go through one full emission system under warranty. My driving habits were the cause though. A lot of short trips and too much idling at the time. If you take longer trips and don't idle too long, I don't think the emissions components are actually too problematic. There are others that would disagree, and there are outlier examples on both sides, but this was my experience with a fixed dieselgate car. Power add-ons. The default answer to power out of a TDI is a pothole and tune, though you can get a Malone tune without deletes and add that on later. Kerma also offers intact emissions tuning, but they do not offer a delete tune to upgrade to. Because of this reason, I would stick with Malone for tuning unless you're 100% certain you'll be keeping the emission system for the life of the vehicle. For other items, there are some dyno results that show a high flow intake does have small advantages, but there is a large debate about this on various forums and Facebook groups. I'll link the dyno results in the description. I personally do have an aftermarket intake on my car, but I understand it's mostly a difference in sound, and for me personally, I wanted to remove the airbox since the screws had rusted and stripped twice on me already. Finding diesel fuel. I've never had an issue finding a station that offers diesel. At most, I see one station that doesn't offer it and the next does. That's been my experience driving around in the Midwest at least. As far as where to fill up if you have options or can plan it out, I personally try to go to stations truckers go to. That ensures they have a fresh batch, which can also help the various components of the fuel system, which is especially important on the common rail cars with high pressure fuel pumps. Fuel additives. I personally run fuel additives in my car. It's relatively cheap peace of mind. I use power service and store it in these Liquamali diesel additive bottles to transport it. Power service bottles leak, and when they leak, they smell horrible and stain whatever they touch. The Liquamali bottles haven't leaked on me yet, and it's easy to carry one tank worth of fluid. I simply use the power service calculator to figure out roughly how much to fill the Liquamali bottle and use it that way. Oil. The oil specifications on these cars are pretty easy to find and follow. Here are some examples on screen. The only outlier that needs mentioning is the Pump Deuce 505.01 oil. There are some 5W30 oils with this oil cert, but the general consensus is that running the 5W40 will protect the camshaft better. Common failures. Most common failures on all of these are emissions components, EGRs, DPFs, AdBlue systems. The pothole is equally aimed at reliability as it is at power or fuel economy gains. The pump deuce engines have the aforementioned camshaft issues when improperly oiled. The ALH has issues with glow plug harnesses. The pump deuce can get a cold camshaft upgrade so you never have to think about it again, and the glow plug harness on an ALH is a little over $100 for OEM. Other items are going to be chassis related instead of engine related, so I'll refrain from going deeper. Automatic transmissions. 
The automatics on the ALH cars is the 01M 4-speed, with the Mark III's using a very similar 4-speed auto. Being a 4-speed, these aren't going to get great fuel economy, and they aren't known for being robust. I've personally had to replace the harness and solenoids on my brother's 2.0 Mark IV wagon that is equipped with the same transmission, and while it's not the worst job in the world, it's certainly not fun. The later Mark IVs with the pump deuce come with a 5-speed Tiptronic automatic, which are better, but still widely disregarded because they simply won't last as long as the engine will. The dual clutch or DSG transmissions on the Mark V through the Mark VII cars are quite reliable if you keep up on maintenance. You should be doing a DSG fluid and filter change every 40,000 miles on these, otherwise you risk a lot of problems. I would recommend 40 to 60,000 mile fluid and filter intervals on any automatic transmission and every 60 to 80k on manuals, but for the dual clutch gearboxes especially, every 40k. Manual Transmissions while these transmissions will typically last the life of the vehicle, there are reports of DMF failure. A symptom of this would be chattering at idle and low speeds. This is most often caused by abusive driving, particularly not downshifting to pass and flooring it in a high gear. If you do need to replace the DMF, put in an upgraded DMF, upgraded clutch, and replace the slave cylinder. Same goes for if you need to replace the slave cylinder, because on a Mark V through Mark VII manual car, the slave cylinder is unfortunately internal on those transmissions, so to swap it out, you'll have to drop the whole transmission. If at any point you have to drop the transmission, I would recommend upgrading. If you do begin to go down this rabbit hole, you might find mentions of a single mass flywheel upgrade. These are fine on early Mark V transmissions and on Mark IVs, but do not use a single mass flywheel on a Mark VI or Mark VII. This is a highly debated topic, but to add some clarity, the Mark IV and early Mark V use brass synchros. They can hold up to a single mass flywheel. The Mark VI and VII cars use steel synchros and can be destroyed with a single mass flywheel. As I mentioned in the automatic transmission segment, I would recommend doing fluid and filter changes on these every 60 to 80,000 miles as peace of mind. I plan for this to be my forever car so I have no issue going above and beyond to keep it in tip top shape. TDI Stigma I have run into some people that want to talk about the emission scandal, respectfully or disrespectfully. I proudly present the Dieselgate topic on my car. It's no secret, but when I talk with someone who is less than happy with what they think the TDI has done to the planet, I do my best to rationalize things with them. Bringing up real world numbers, such as a modern diesel is cleaner than an older gasoline car. And unless I was going to step into a car payment again, which I have no intention of doing, I'd be replacing my TDI with an old gas car, which would actually be worse for the environment mile per mile. And that's discounting a handful of things. Parts aren't carbon neutral to replace. So far, engine-wise, I've had to replace nothing besides filters and oil. Even spark plugs and ignition coils have some carbon emissions when being produced and transported, to wear items that simply aren't present on a diesel motor. Tires are actually the biggest source of emissions on road cars, to the tune of about 2,000 times compared to the tailpipe of the car. The actual amount of pollution caused by motorists is about 15% of the world's total greenhouse gases. This isn't a small amount. But whatever my share is, there are much bigger things at play besides what I drive and how I drive. A dog has a larger carbon footprint than a full-sized truck year to year, but you'd never shout about saving the trees if you saw me walking my dog. A TDI isn't for everyone. Maybe you still can't get past the stigma. Maybe you do run a lot of short trips and can't pothole it. But for those it does make sense for, you won't find a better daily driver or road trip car.